No other river system collects and drains more water than the mighty Amazon. These waters nourish the largest rainforest in the world. But there are even bigger rivers here, dense rivers of water vapor released by trees to form streams of clouds that float above the canopy and redistribute water across the Amazon and beyond. These water-bearing trees are rapidly being destroyed, and so too are the flying rivers. Hey everyone, I'm Tyler. And this is my younger brother, Alex. And together, we're the Water Brothers. We're gonna take you on an adventure around the world to explore the state of our blue planet, a planet defined by water and its ability to sustain life. So join us on our journey as we explore the world, looking at the most important water stories of our time. And together, we will learn how to better protect our most precious resource. A seca nos reservatórios do estado de São Paulo já é considerada a mais grave da história. O nível do sistema cantareira, responsável pelo abastecimento de quase a metade da região metropolitana, chegou hoje a apenas 11,6% da capacidade. A seca obrigou 13 cidades de São Paulo a entrar em racionamento de água. Pelo segundo dia seguido, moradores de Itu, no interior de São Paulo, protestaram contra a falta d'água. De, é, o problema nosso aqui é um dia sim, um dia não, né? Às vezes até indo para a escola, chegar na escola não tem água e buscar ele para vir para casa. Tem semanas que ela chega a vir dois dias, tem semanas que é apenas um. Infelizmente, acho que não tem nem como a gente saber. From the top of this building in downtown Sao Paulo, you get a really good sense of just how massive this city is. This is the largest city in South America, and getting water to its 11 million plus residents is a monumental task, let alone in the middle of a multi-year drought. But as I look around at the thousands upon thousands of apartment buildings in every direction, it makes me wonder, where would all these people go if this city really did run completely out of water? How is it possible that Brazil, with the world's largest fresh water supply, could experience water shortages, especially in its biggest city? So today we're heading outside the city limits to check out the Cantareira Reservoir System to see just how drastic the situation has become. Sao Paulo's water supply system is almost entirely dependent on five interconnected reservoirs that store water during the wet season for the long dry season. But a lack of rainfall for over two years greatly reduced water levels throughout the network. So we're here at the bottom of what used to be a giant reservoir. Just a few years ago, this whole valley would have been filled with water. And you can see the former high water mark at the tree line right behind me. There used to be a marina right here. There should be boats whizzing above our head. But now all that's left is really just the puddle. And it's amazing to think that a city like Sao Paulo, millions of people are relying on dwindling reservoirs like these, and they're still pumping out every last drop. The reasons for Sao Paulo's drought are numerous. Rapid population growth, poor urban planning, and aging pipes that leak 40% of all treated water. But if we wanted to understand the root cause of Sao Paulo's crisis, the answer lies much further north, in the heart of the Amazon rainforest. The Amazon rainforest covers an area almost as large as the continental United States. Not only do these trees create a home for millions of species, many of which are found nowhere else on Earth, but they also produce about 20% of the world's oxygen and suck up 20% of global carbon dioxide emissions, providing a critical buffer against human-induced climate change. One of the most breathtaking perspectives of the Amazon forest you can ever have is from up here, above the canopy. We've just climbed 45 meters up to the top of this research tower in the Tapajos Nature Reserve, 
and we're surrounded by untouched old growth forest in every direction. And from up here, you also can really appreciate the value of trees to the water cycle because each one of these trees behind me right now is transpiring between 300 and 1,000 liters of water into the atmosphere every single day. We can't see it, but we know this process is happening because the evidence is right above us in the clouds. Native people knew this all along, that where you have forests, you have rain, and not the other way around. The trees are indeed an incredible irrigation machine in reverse. Instead of putting water down, and they pump water from the ocean of fresh water in, in the ground. They have deep roots. They suck water in, pump more than 60 meters in the air, and spray it to the atmosphere, so to speak, transpire. All plants need water to grow but only a tiny fraction of the water that plants take in through roots is actually used in photosynthesis. The rest is pushed up and out through leaves as water vapor in a process called evapotranspiration, a vital part of the water cycle. Nowhere else on Earth is this transpiration effect more powerful than in the Amazon. So much water vapor is emitted by this forest that these clouds have been given their own name, the flying rivers. The flying rivers, or the aerial rivers, as we refer to them, or rivers of vapor, they are the supply of fresh water to the continents. Without those supplies of fresh water, you would have the continents drying up until it becomes desert. The journey of the flying rivers begins over the Atlantic Ocean, as huge volumes of water are evaporated near the equator and blown towards the South American continent by the trade winds. As these clouds reach the Amazon, they dump water on the forest that has transpired back into the atmosphere. As these new clouds hit the Andes, they are pushed south, constantly releasing water and recharging by transpiration all along the way, before reaching the south of Brazil and northern Argentina. But as large swaths of the forest are cut down and converted to farmland, critical links in this chain are being broken. One of the best ways to see how the Amazon rainforest is being transformed is to see it from the air. So we're about to begin a flying journey across the Amazon with a pilot named Gerard Moss, who's been studying the amount of water transpired by the forest and how the water cycle is changing across the entire country and continent as the forest has been removed. Gerard has been flying in the Amazon for over 30 years and has set numerous records, including the first round-the-world flight in a motorized glider. Experienced pilots are essential when flying in the Amazon, where turbulence is always high and runways to make emergency landings are few and far between. Well, Gerard, we've uh, reached our cruising altitude. We've got the autopilot on, got a chance to talk now. Um, we are going to some remote areas. We're flying over some virgin forest right now, and we're in a single-engine airplane. How safe are we in this plane? In principle, according to statistics, uh, the chance of your only heart stopping now is about the same as my engine stopping at this age. <laughs> the odds are in our favor then. In 2007, Gerard and his wife Margie and a team of Brazilian scientists started the Flying Rivers Project to unravel the mystery of exactly how water vapor and rainfall circulate across Brazil. Before carnival, before uh, football, which is important, Actually, Brazil is a water country. We have the largest amount of rainfall per square meter in the world by far, and a lot of that rainfall is due to the presence of the Amazon forest. While the concept of flying rivers in Brazil had been theorized for decades, no one had attempted to accurately measure the effect across the entire country until Gerard converted his plane into a flying laboratory and retrofitted it with special equipment to capture droplets of water in the clouds. Each droplet they collected contained an isotopic signature that allowed scientists to determine whether each drop had been evaporated by a tree or from the ocean. After several years and hundreds of flights, scientists were able to use the data to estimate the total amount of water transpired by the forest. The transpiration of trees is so massive that in the calculation we did for the entire Amazon catchment, it was larger than the Amazon River, the flow of the Amazon River. So 
20 billion tons or 20 trillion liters of water per day evaporated. So you get an idea of the size, the sheer size of this machine, this irrigation, reverse irrigation machine. This data also confirmed once and for all that cities in the south of Brazil, like Sao Paulo, receive a significant portion of their rainfall directly from the Amazon and the flying rivers. That was really a shock to many Brazilians who did not realize that even though they are living in Sao Paulo, only 50 kilometers from the coast, which would be the original and the logical source of fresh water from the ocean, that in fact they were getting their water from west, inbound, from the mountains, from the Amazon, from 3,000 kilometers away. And so what happens in the Amazon is important on the climate of areas far away. And it's not just major cities that are dependent on this rainfall. Sustainable agriculture depends really on the presence of the forest. Uh, Brazil is one of the lucky countries that is able to produce its food stuff and, and, and its agricultural activity using only 5% of irrigation. So 95% of the production in Brazil is rainfall. And that's a miracle in itself, and the miracle is called the Amazon. The Amazon contains over 400 billion trees that each play an important role in creating rain. But this miracle is threatened on all fronts, from loggers to illegal gold mines, new hydroelectric dams, and farmers clearing land for livestock and crops. Of course, in 30 years, I've seen a lot of destruction. We've lost in Brazil approximately 20% of the uh, coverage of the Amazon forest. So it's a, it's, it's a problem, but uh, obviously these losses were compensated by economical benefits, uh, but we know now it's not really working. Although the Brazilian government has been able to reduce the rate of deforestation by 70% over the past decade, over 80 billion trees have already been lost. So the transpiration effect has been reduced and humidity has dropped, making the remaining forests dry out and become more susceptible to forest fires. Gerard and his colleagues fear that the flying rivers are now no longer carrying as much water to the southern regions of Brazil, cities like Sao Paulo, and the hydropower dams and reservoirs that depend on rainfall to produce 80% of Brazil's electricity. You cannot lose so many trees, you know, billions of trees in an area, knowing what we know about this evaporation and the contribution of this in the tree without affecting somehow the climate somewhere. Slowing Amazon deforestation will not be an easy task simply because there are so many different industries and groups of people that are responsible for the loss of trees. But of all the different causes of deforestation, none have been more destructive than cattle ranching. Cattle ranching in Brazil is big business, generating billions of dollars for the economy and creating nearly half a million jobs. Brazil's the largest exporter of beef in the world. They have about one cow per person, 210 million people, 210 million head of cattle today. Brazilian beef is consumed in over 120 countries, and one in five pounds of all beef sold in the world is from Brazil. This massive industry is responsible for 70% of Amazon deforestation, so any solution for preserving the forest must involve efforts to both improve cattle ranching methods and reduce global demand for beef. John Carter came from Texas to Brazil in the 1990s to raise cattle with his Brazilian wife. He now heads an organization helping cattle ranchers become more sustainable. When John flew his small Cessna airplane to settle in Brazil, deforestation was at record highs, and he was alarmed to see that even the farmers who were trying to conserve their forest were being attacked by land invaders and organized crime syndicates, destroying forest reserves to start ranches of their own. We were surrounded by problems, surrounded by constant violence, uh, killings, ambushes, violence that you, know, that you wouldn't even believe. It's a tropical version of the Old West, there's no doubt about it. John also observed that many ranchers were not managing their land efficiently, and overgrazing was depleting soil productivity, forcing landowners to cut down more and more trees as their soil became unproductive or simply eroded away. What Alianza is, is really an insurgency. So we're, we're in this massive development process, and Alianza is actually working with the very people who are on the ground who are part of the problem, and we're trying to make them part of the solution. The farmer in the red can't take care of the green. 
So as long as he has debt or he can't make any money, he's not going to care about nature. Alianza de Terra assists farmers in many ways, from the adoption of improved soil and water conservation methods to genetic improvements that introduce new strains of cattle that grow faster and require less land than the traditional strains that dominate the local industry. In return, farmers gain access to new international markets and better prices for their beef. Não, é, mudou sim, tem melhorado, ganha, tá, tem um ganho de peso mais rápido. Então, dando mais peso, dá mais real. É, se a gente estamos conseguindo ren a renumeração melhor, dá, dá para ficar no, no, peri no, no espaço que está sem derrubar mais mata. Né? O qual batalhamos junto na conscientização da população. Né? A gente deu a cara a tapa aí muitas vezes de pessoas que detestavam Aliança da Terra e a gente conseguiu chegar mais perto e hoje a maioria já está conscientizado que isso é coisa que deveria acontecer. While sustainable ranching makes a positive difference, it cannot solve the problem on its own unless the full economic value of the forest is recognized. It's not cattle, it's not soybeans, it's not timber. It's that the soil is worth five to eight times more than the forest on top of it. You keep forest standing, your property value is less. It's a target for invasion. It has no value to you. Farmers and land invaders alike are in a never-ending race to convert forest to pasture. And their method of choice is fire. Fire is the cheapest way to both intimidate, dominate, and exterminate. It's used by landowners that, for instance, don't want to get a permit to clear cut or know that they can't get a permit to clear cut. And so they'll start fire to burn their own forest and they'll claim that it was a lightning strike and maybe do it a couple of years in a row. And then you can get a crop duster and seed it and you got grass and more fuel and you burn it again. And then all of a sudden, all of your forest is gone. Forest fires have become the most significant cause of Amazon degradation. And in 2015 alone, over 235,000 forest fires were recorded across Brazil. You have this magnificent ecosystem that's under siege. We are extremely concerned that by the time it's all gone and everyone says, well, shoot, what happened? So, well, you dumbasses, we've been telling you for 30 years. Uh, and so instead of waiting until I'm old and come back and call someone a dumbass, uh, we decided to put the fires out. In 2009, Alianza de Terra started its own firefighting brigade and began working with locals and indigenous communities on fire prevention and education programs. Although the Brazilian government has forced firefighters, they are chronically underfunded and do not operate on private lands where some of the most severe fires are set. We just arrived here in Kumayara village near the Shingu River and we're here with a team from Alianza de Terra that's been training local Indians how to fight forest fires that have been raging throughout the region as cattle ranches and farms spread. Like all indigenous communities here, the Kamiura are extremely dependent on the forest for their survival, from their food and water to their housing and even medicine. Pessoal da a pecuária, né, que vem desmatar no encostar na na nossa reserva, né? É, a clima nosso, é, para poder chover, é muito fraco. Não chove mais no, na época. Se a gente não, não cuidar da nossa floresta, e vai mudar mais ainda. Não é só aqui, não. O povo no Brasil também está sofrendo. Lá está faltando água. For centuries, the Kamayura burned their cropland after the harvest to fertilize the soil, and the fires would dwindle out naturally upon reaching the moist forest edge. But today, the destruction of trees across the region has greatly reduced the moisture content of the flying rivers, causing the forest to dry out, and the fires they set often burn out of control. We went there due to a long-standing partnership and friendship with them to provide support, training, and leadership to combat that problem head on. Not to simply go to a meeting and talk about it, but to take the fight to the field, to give them uh, uh, excellence in training, excellence in leadership, excellence in equipment, 
and then give them the self-determination to take control of their own property. The project has been so successful that other tribes throughout the Shingu region have traveled great distances to take part in these programs. It doesn't do any good just to work with one group of people because fire doesn't know fence boundaries and you really have to work across the whole landscape. Training's just started. We've come to the edge of the forest and uh, we're gonna find out what it takes to fight a forest fire in the Amazon. All right. On the road, on the road. Ah, okay. <laughs> so right now we're clearing a line so that when they uh, start the burn, it doesn't spread into the forest. So we're creating this protection line. We're just waiting for this big part of the fire to burn off and then uh, we're going to come through in the tail end after they sprayed some water on it and get out the last remnants of the fire. The key to do it is do nice slow motions, nice slow taps and uh, see if I can make the cut. They've become heroes in this region and heroes since they brought governance and they brought peace. They've created a hole in the smoke in the Southeast Amazon. Well, the heat's intense. Uh, it's amazing how uh, fast you have to move. That's why teamwork's so important. That's why training like this is so important because if you don't have teamwork, fires are just gonna go out of control. So it's just really special to see how they're getting uh, members of tribes, actually from all different communities working together to fight these fires because it could largely be up to them to put out the fires that are going to destroy the most untouched forests that, uh, that we have left. In this region, it's the eastern, northeastern quadrant of Mato Grosso. Fire has been reduced here due to the actions of Alianza firefighters by up to 60%. It was an enormous reduction. We, we got letters from health departments from counties that were spontaneous saying, thank you all for reducing our respiratory disease for the first time in the past 10 years. Se acender o fogo aqui, vai pegando, vai queimando tudo pra lá. Nós a medicinar, se embira, é pinta aí, que a gente vai se para pra casa, né? E queima essa terra. É isso pra nós é muito difícil. Não tem como controlar, né? Hoje, hoje em dia o pessoal tá cuidando. Entendeu? Esse agora, de ano passado, que vocês não estão treinando, para esse ano foi. Não foi muito fogo aqui para o perto, né? Aqui, não foi muito. The fate of the flying rivers and the water supply of cities like Sao Paulo are entirely dependent on Brazil's ability to conserve its life-giving rainforest. And long-term preservation can only be achieved through education. One major component of Gerard's Flying Rivers project has been to work with teachers and students across the country to ensure that as many youth as possible are aware of all the important connections between the forest, the delicate water cycle, and the very water they drink. We've now actually reached about 3,500 teachers that in turn actually managed to teach 650,000 kids. And we're, we're aiming and fighting to get to a million kids within next year. If you get all the moisture from the Amazon, if you destroy the Amazon, what one should expect? So I've been saying, basically, a stern warning. We cannot destroy the Amazon any further. And more, we have to replant the Amazon. Just keeping what's left is not enough because the climate is already drifting in the Amazon and outside. The reasons for the deforestation of the Amazon are complex and will not be easily solved. And as this incredible forest is lost, it affects all of us. But for the people of Brazil, the stakes could not be higher. Thankfully, there are groups of dedicated people here creating models for sustainable development and helping the public better understand that agriculture, water infrastructure management, climate change, and deforestation are deeply interconnected. And what we can all take away from this journey is the undeniable and critical role of trees in the water cycle everywhere in the world. When we conserve forests, we protect so much that is vital to our survival. 
Join us and dive deeper into the episodes at thewaterbrothers.ca.